and welcome back everybody uh so just as our guests there we go get their videos going uh thank you very much for rejoining us and a uh, welcome uh please make welcome our guests this afternoon we have uh owen jones from the ifrs foundation technical staff many of you will know many of you will also know richard boson from amana who has for the last 12 months being seconded more than 12 months being seconded uh to efrag uh that we were hearing about earlier uh and uh, many of you will also know stuart rowan who for the last 12 months has been on the x bureau international uh staff working uh on a dedicated basis with a special working group uh, that has been externally funded kindly by uh, the Tipping Point Foundation, by the Impact Management Project, by PwC and by Wakiva. Uh, and that has allowed us to have uh, Stuart working full time on this exercise to try to help us work through some of the issues uh, involved in digital reporting of sustainability matters. So um, I want to preface everybody's remarks by making it clear that um, neither Richard nor Owen are the standard setters. Uh, they are the staff doing the, uh, doing the technical work. So they certainly can't set any standards or indeed change standards that are out there. Um, but uh, the, the SIG has been meeting, uh, at first it was meeting every week, it's then been meeting every two weeks uh, with key standard setters from around the world, including from these three folk. Uh, and this has been an effort to look at some of the differences uh, between financial disclosures that many people are used to and sustainability disclosures. Um, so uh, perhaps we could start by going around the room and getting people to quickly introduce themselves and their organisations a little bit better than I did. Um, and then we might uh, then we might ask you each a question. Um, so, Owen, do you want to start? Yeah, hi. Thank you for introducing uh, me, John. <laughs> Um, I'm Owen Jones. I'm working for the IFRS Foundation as the lead of their taxonomy development team. Um, obviously, in the past, we've been working on the ISSB, IASB's accounting taxonomy, and we're now looking to also work and develop a sustainability reporting taxonomy for the sustainability standards from the ISSB. Thank you. Richard. Thank you. So my name is Richard. I'm uh, the head of XBRL at Amana and I have a technical background. I developed uh, XBRL software for more than 10 years at Amana. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I am now seconded to uh, the European Financial Reporting Agency. And I worked in, in the cluster nine of the project task force, which was responsible for the digitization. And we developed an x taxonomy, a proof of concept, actually. It's a very small one, not uh, to be compared to the one from ISSB in size, at least. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it was just a proof of concept. And now um, IFRAC has just started the project to actually implement the full x taxonomy for the set one standard that has just been uh, issued. Thank you very much. And uh, Stuart? I'm Stuart Rowan. I've been working in digital reporting in XBRL for about 16 years now. That's included participating in a variety of taxonomy projects, building data collection systems for regulators, and building XBRL software, and spreading knowledge through training and advice. And as John's already covered, uh, for the last 12 months, I've had the pleasure of facilitating the DSD SIG for XBRL International. So uh, we, I've, I've said DSD SIG. You've said DSD SIG. What's the DSD SIG, Stu? Let's just start there, and then we'll, we'll, then we'll dive into some questions. Fair enough. Uh, so the Digital Sustainability Disclosure Special Interest Group, which is a mouthful, so sometimes it just gets abbreviated to DSD SIG or the SIG. Um, so it's a private forum for open discussions between sustainability standard setters and regulators. Um, we tend to discuss challenges in digital disclosure and then the possible solutions uh, that we can come up with to them. And that leads to further conversations, uh, particularly where there might be different solutions in play, and then agreement on proposed best practices. So that's it in a nutshell, um, but I'm happy to go into further detail as required. 
Well, we, I might just add one thing, which is to say that um, we've started to make some aspects of the work of the SIG public, and there's a little microsite, uh, which is dsd.expl.org, which has a range of information, some of which we'll cover today, uh, as well as a number of examples. So um, for everybody, we're, we're coming up to a series of um, hopefully well-connected sustainability mandates from around the world. And this throws up some interesting challenges when, when reporting in a digital manner. If you could wave a magic wand, what would you change about digital reporting? Uh, Richard, do you want to start? Yeah, that's um, that's a good question, actually. So um, first of all, I think right now uh, the focus should be on the narrative reporting because uh, I know for sure that the ESRS uh, um, X-ray uh, taxonomy and or, or the, the standard in general, as well as some other reporting standards, um, are quite um, heavily using narrative disclosures. And I think it's it's pretty obvious, as we also have heard in the previous uh, presentation, that the comparison and the, the methodology or the methods to extract numerical data, for instance, or Boolean values, dates, whatever, this is great. This is working excellent. But for the narrative uh, ones, I think um, the biggest challenge would be to actually uh, yeah, find ways on um, how to make it um, not a burden for preparers on one side and very usable for the users for the consumers of the data on the other side yeah so to find the right balance and uh, i don't actually uh, I, I don't know how the solution would look like so it's uh, the magic wand would be nice because then uh, i would have the solution but at least that that's the main challenge that i see and uh, yeah i'm also very curious how the um, IFRAC um, um, X-ray taxonomy will actually be looking like uh, next year when it uh, will be published in terms of uh, narrative uh, reporting. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And Owen? Yeah, I think if I could wave a magic wand, it would be to take the sort of experience we've learned over the last 15 years and magically produce a nice harmonized system where everybody had got to the same place, but without that history. Because I think one of the things we have in digital reporting, certainly on the accounting side, and maybe there is a magical moment on the sustainability side for us to take advantage of everyone moving at the same time to avoid this. But one thing we have is lots of people have had to try out, work out and develop approaches to digital reporting and with the best will in the world, they've just gone in slightly different directions in different jurisdictions. And I think for people who are involved in the process, it's complicated. There's a lot of unnecessary differences in places. There's a lot of mandates that are similar, but not quite the same. There's a lot of lack of opportunities for economy of scale. You've got lots of, I think at the IFRS Foundation, we, we look at sort of an ideal view of digital reporting is sort of globally accessible data that's globally comparable, that's easily available and easily and easily usable by people. And I think what you oh and that's reliable and assured. And I think what you find is that in different jurisdictions around the world you have little pieces of those. But I don't think there's anywhere where everything is perfectly aligned. There's good practice in many places but sometimes there's the practice that's just slightly different, the requirements are just slightly different, the assurance requirements are slightly different, um, the approaches to developing taxonomies in different, in different jurisdictions are just slightly different to make life complicated. And I think if we could wave a magic wand, it would be take the best parts of everything, put it all together in one coherent system and smooth out a lot of those differences. Now, I think we've, we've gone through the pain and the experience of this on the accounting and many other sides. Now, maybe there's a wonderful opportunity on the sustainability side to try and minimize some of those. On the other hand, we all have the usual problems of regulation is coming. Timelines are, are fast. The deadlines are rapidly approaching. So maybe we won't be able to be perfect, but at least with bearing that in mind, bearing that objective in mind and trying to minimize people's difficulties, um, maybe we can work together to kind of get to the best place we possibly can. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I like that use of the magic wand. Uh, please, please wave it immediately, um, but uh, perhaps with less magic and a lot more meetings to a certain extent. Um, creating some of the meetings of the minds has been the purpose of the SIG to date. Um, Stuart, do you want to jump in with, uh, with uh, your approach uh, with, a, with a magic wand? 
Uh, yeah, um, I think mine's probably a bit of a follow on there, but it was a, it was a relatively simple one. Um, at the moment, journalists, investors, they all still tend to go to the company's PDF report. And I would like digital reporting to become the primary focus for both preparers and consumers. So that's it in a nutshell. Simple. Also, use of the magic wand will accelerate what hopefully is a natural process. Thank you very much. Um, so what we thought we might do uh, would, was dive into just a few of the uh, questions and issues that uh, the SIG has been looking at over the last 12 months. Um, there's, there's a number of them, and a number of them you can find on that microsite, uh, which there's a link off the homepage of our, of our website as well. But um, it, it covers a, a range of things, including things like the fact that sustainability disclosures that have been voluntary to date, historically, they've had lots and lots of cross-references to other reports. Oh, if you want details about this, go to page 96 of this report over there. Um, and of course, all those reports have typically been PDF. So in a digital world, what happens there? Do the regulators need to require that everything turns into a single report? Do they need to be able to ensure that each of those reports are digital or do they need to do something else? Those are the, some of the kinds of questions that have been debated within this group. But let's, at a sort of a practical level, perhaps we could um, we could dive into something like the, 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 the narrative tagging that you were talking about, uh, Richard. Um, there are various aspects of narrative tagging, um, including the fact that it's to a certain extent um, uh it has a tendency to to naturally be nested um maybe stuart you could you could um provide some examples of of that and, and run us through what the, the, some of the some of the issues and questions that arise here yep sure i'm gonna share my screen So um, here is an example of a fictitious sustainability report. And when we talk about narrative tagging, we're talking about putting these boxes, these tags around uh, text rather than numeric data. So here we've got uh, a few paragraphs, but it's been split into two tags. So this bottom one I've highlighted is information on carbon offsetting practice and purchase. And then there's a different one up here. So these aren't nested. These are just uh, side by side. Um, uh, but here we do have a nested tag. So right in the middle of this progress report, we have um, another tag, um, which is about emissions are lower than last year. And we've tagged a sentence. So this is doing two, two different things. So we've got a nested tag, but we've also got what's called a Boolean tag. So although I've tagged a sentence saying to humans, we are very pleased that our emissions have reduced again this year, the machine readable value has been tagged just as true. So... Um, that uh, is one of the clever things we can do with inline XBRL is map from uh, something that's human readable but hard for a machine to understand to something that's very easy for a machine to understand, which is a true, false, or Boolean fact. Um, and one of the things that's come up a few times in uh, sustainability is not just this idea of having nested tagging and Booleans, but also um, something called extensible enumerations. So where a Boolean is true or false, uh, you might have, for example, a target that's an intensity or an absolute target. Um, so you can see we've said we've got an intensity target here, but the fact value comes out as intensity. Um, the other thing you can have is sets of um, values. So, for example, uh, a list of countries. Um, so uh, that is nested tagging, but also the fact it's not always just text. Sometimes you're actually having these other types of values there. Um, with that demoed, I might just stop sharing so let the discussion continue, if that makes sense. Thanks very much, Stuart. Um, and I think if you could turn your video back on again, we can see you as well. Um, so uh, I guess I'd preface that. I, I think that's a really good example of some of the things, but there's probably two issues that are going to be front of mind there. One is that it will require some specific decisions by these standard setters to use tools like the Boolean function. Is that is that something that's realistic, uh, do you think, Owen? Yes, I think so. It's definitely something where the 
SSB have been considering what tools you can use that are available in, in XBRL or data consumption to, uh, to allow reports to be most consumable and most useful to analysts. And those Booleans were one of the things that we, uh, and um, enumerations were one of the things we felt would be quite helpful to allow people to do initial sorting and filtering and assessing of reports before then looking in more detail. Um, you know, it's quite complicated often to identify which of my population has the characteristics I'm interested in. If the reporting is only in a narrative, possibly many, possibly in many different languages, those boiling a little response down to, okay, something that's easily comparable between people sometimes would be quite useful for that. So we thought it was quite helpful. Um, and it's been quite helpful in the SIG to have those conversations about, well, how might that actually work in practice? What are the limitations? What are the areas we might need to work on, either guidance or in the specification to kind of make it work a bit better? And and indeed, that's, uh, those are going to be just debates within uh, various best practices, working groups and, and, other, and, and the like as we, as we move forward. Um, Richard, I imagine one of the other issues around narrative tagging there is the just the, uh, the the technical mechanism for creating tag uh, nesting and and narrative tagging generally, it's uh, pretty well known amongst all of those that are operating in the ESEF space in Europe um, that there are some limitations with today's software about how easy how easily some of that kind of tagging can be done and and how easily it uh, can be uh, provided uh, in a in a human readable manner. Is that something that concerns you, or do you think this is just sort of a, a temporary uh, issue, and by the time that sustainability disclosure comes around, the software vendors might have overcome some of those limitations? Oh, I'm sure there will be uh, improvements. Um, I think it's just natural that there is a kind of a limit in, in terms of uh, nesting, that um, if this limit is exceeds, exceeded, then it will be hard either for preparers um, for instance, just speaking on behalf of Amana, uh, where we have functionalities to have nested tags, of course, but if you have like up to six or seven or eight levels, then it will be just hard to 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 keep the overview, yeah, because it's just a, a lot of tagging for one paragraph or one sentence. And I think that's just natural. Yeah? And, and the other side is also true for audit firms. Uh, for instance, that are currently reviewing those taggings, it's also hard for an auditor uh, to review a paragraph if there are uh, five or six or seven uh, tags attached to to each uh, to the paragraph itself. For instance, uh, when you consider the iXPR viewers that are usually used in, I think, in most of the software products, um, they tend to use a, a color to highlight the tagging. Um, and then the question is, how many colors do you need to display all the different tags and how do you make it? Do you have one is green and then the other one a little bit darker green and more dark green and so on. Yeah. So, but I'm sure there will be solutions for that. Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's obvious, but we should be careful not to uh, overwhelm and to, to drive it to the top actually with a, with a, a NASA tagging. But the example actually, and I enjoyed really working with you, uh, Stuart and Owen and everybody else involved in the, um, in the working group is, I think it's pretty good. And uh, this kind of nesting where you have, for instance, a Boolean inside the narrative yeah, or a single single aspect is actually being tagged, uh, that's absolutely okay. Yeah? The, the thing that worries me a lot is more the, if you have really big narrative tagging that are spanning the whole paragraph or the whole chapter, then I don't see a lot of benefit. Yeah. Um, so there's going to need to one. be some it's a, go ahead, sorry. I think that's one area where we're learning something quite useful from the ESEF implementations, where the narrative reporting is being used and, and people trying to work out what tags to use in what place. Um, it's telling us as, as regulators, as taxonomy developers, that we need to be quite careful about getting the right balance between what you ask people to tag and what's th and that's then useful for people in terms of the information they can use, but also fits with the way that the preparers prepare their reports so it's there's a fairly you know there is a limited amount of nesting that's required and some kind of alignment with the reporting but it also provides the granularity that the that the user of the information they're interested in and there's no point going overboard but you need to make sure you do capture the right things and getting that balance i think is quite important those are really helpful points did you want to add to that at all stuart nope 
we, we might move on then. Um, so it's probably apparent from the discussions that we've had and the presentations we've had today that although we are seeing a worldwide drive towards uh, sustainability disclosures, and by the way, we've only just touched on other jurisdictions like India and Japan and China, uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan, these are all environments that are looking at, at sustainability disclosure. Um, but it's probably clear that one size isn't going to fit all. There's, that's one aspect. Some countries will say, well, we're going to do climate disclosures, but maybe we won't do these other kinds of sustainability disclosures. So there'll be a bit of picking and choosing at a jurisdictional level. But equally, we have at least three elements of our clear soup of our bouillon. We have we have it with the ISSB, we have the EFRAG framework, and we have the SEC at this point. Um, and they're not always necessarily uh, providing exactly the same requirements on companies, but in some areas they are. So uh, it would be unfortunate, wouldn't it, if um, we ended up with three taxonomies, for example, all saying the same thing. Can, who wants to, to introduce this idea of, of uh, what we're calling a GTCR, um, or the idea of a shared registry to permit shared taxonomy schemas between, uh, between standard setters? Not policy, not defined, but some ideas and research that's carried out at this point. Anyone want to jump in on that just to start off before we demonstrate what that might look like? Well, I can give it a try if you like. Uh, yeah, um, please. <clears throat> so I think ideally, um, if we, if somebody is su supposed to develop an expert taxonomy and the underlying standard is referring to other standards, in a perfect world, you would simply just, uh, for instance, take the other expert taxonomy of the underlying standard and just reuse their elements by by making a taxonomy extension, basically. Yeah. But in the real world, um, usually uh, things happen that, for instance, there is no underlying taxonomy because the underlying standard does not have it, does not provide it. Or uh, what could also happen is that even if the, the disclosure requirement or the data point definition is being based on a different uh, reporting standard, um, it is still being a little bit different implemented in the actual standard. So by adding certain restrictions, for instance, yeah, um, making it no longer the same comparable data point anymore. Yeah? And um, then the question is, what do we do? Do we really go for having a duplicate element? Actually, uh, um, that would be a worst case for the same thing, which is not exactly the same thing, but Indeed, we uh, uh, yeah we are talking about uh, uh, of uh, yeah a similar data point I would say yeah and uh, a, a typical example I think that everybody can it's it's not only limited to sustainability it's uh, we also have it in accounting I guess we for instance a typical example is the revenue tech I think it exists in in all the accounting uh, gap standards and and expert taxonomies or the name of the company, pretty obvious one. Why do we have a name of the company or name of entity or whatever uh, in, in IFRS taxonomy, SEC taxonomy, um, and, and probably in all other, other taxonomies as well? Do we really need to have the same uh, definition uh, uh, um, uh, multiplied for each and every taxonomy? No, that, that was the um, original idea as far as I remember that we discussed. Maybe it would be possible to have like a generic dictionary or, or collection or registry. Uh, I think registry is a term that is used usually in expert terminology um, where you can actually have a single element that is can also be used in all the different taxonomies without providing a, a, um, a certain meaning with it, a certain reference to a standard or uh, um, an interpretation. Yeah, And that was the basic idea. And now, Stuart, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, um, was it a good introduction? I think it was a great introduction. Um, yeah, I just uh, probably one of the, um, in, in terms of the, the different groups of things we're thinking about. So if it was, for example, ISO country or currency codes, um, we'd probably, that's something that already exists in a, in a digital format. So it's about mechanically turning them into XBRL, whereas, as, as you say, whether it's documents and entity information or 
TCFD definitions or anything else, it's it's going to need a bit of agreement from people on the best way to represent them. Uh, did you want to add anything to that, Owen, or do you want uh, Stuart to show people what uh, what the groups come up with? I think the only thing I'd add would be that it the the sort of motivation was that even if two or three different implementations maybe obviously in a similar area for example sustainability are not quite the same one thing that's particularly useful is to highlight those areas where the bits and pieces are the same where you do have similarities you know there is absolutely no point in everybody defining an expert element for scope one emissions if we're all referring to the same underlying definition for that um you know and on those little places so to make those areas where there is comparability and those aspects that you can look at to try and align data to be as clear as possible about those. So perhaps take that away, Stuart, with a little demonstration of, of uh, what Richard and Owen are talking about there. Will do. So I've, uh, I've got two variants on this to uh, quickly show everyone. Um, one is... Uh, uh, on made up taxonomy so we're looking at a taxonomy that's the sustainable energy taxonomy sorry the sustainability 2022 taxonomy but it has this for energy specifically it's got this separate module for sustainability uh, energy concepts and the idea is uh, it's got all the different data so most of it's against the 22 taxonomy but the energy bits against the energy and then if we flip to a different company's filing well, they've reported against a completely different taxonomy, taxonomy B, but uh, they have reported their energy against what is effectively a common module or a module they've borrowed from the other taxonomy. So that's one way of doing it. You might be using a module from a different taxonomy. Um, and then with uh, mild apologies to Richard and Owen, um, you can do a variant of that, which is, so this is a fiddled with version of the IFRS taxonomy where most of it's been tagged against IFRS taxonomy, but then we've introduced this idea of a shared concept for the scope one and scope two emissions, as they're both talking about. And we can do the same with EFRAG, uh, where most of it is against the small sample taxonomy, Richard talked about. Um, but we can change the scope one emissions to be against the shared GTCR taxonomy. So this is just using using that common module that's that's neither part of one or the other, um, but they can both access the concepts in it. And that means that in terms of comparing the data, although a lot of the data between the two filings, uh, either sets of example, will not be comparable, um, the data that's been reported for scope one, for example, will immediately become comparable with some caveats. So there we are. That was a rapid run through. I will stop sharing. Just one important nuance there, though, Stuart, which is that uh, it, perhaps it wasn't obvious, but although they are using a shared schema, they're using the rest of their own artifacts. So yep. an SEC filing would be still pointing at the SEC rule and an ISSB filing would be still pointing at the ISSB standard and similarly with EFRAG, right? Do you want me to quickly show it? Oh, you might as well. Go on. <laughs> Go on then. Make your tiny video off. Um, so John's right. Um, if we look at, uh, so first of all, in terms of the pretend one, although we're looking at sustainability energy, this one uh, is referencing ACME standards, whereas this one is representing uh, referencing XYZZY standards. And I can't remember whether I did it for these. I think I did. So you've got the uh, IFRS references here uh, for the IFRS one, but no EFRAG references. And I don't think the EFRAG had any references, but the point is it's not showing the I uh, ISSB references. So there we go. You can choose whether which references to attach, crucially. I think this is also something that uh, definitely will happen with the EFRAG expert taxonomy. It will have, the elements will have their own labels and uh, references, but uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, then just reference the element from the GTCR. 
And by the way, um, also I think one of the advantages uh, that I would um, like to highlight of this approach is that it might potentially reduce the multi-tagging. Because imagine that somebody needs to tag um, or that a company needs to tag uh, according to ESRS, but as well in the US, where for instance, foreign private issuers are listed and they would use uh, a different sustainability uh, standard there. But as long as a uh, scope three greenhouse gas emission, for instance, would be one element, one the same element actually technically, uh, it would not be required to put two tags at the same time on the same uh, uh, number. Yeah, it would be just one. So it would reduce, hopefully, that at least my hope, uh, the multi-tagging, um, uh, yeah, um, multi-tagging uh, efforts. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, did anybody want to add anything to that, um, either by explanation or disclaimer? Hearing none, uh, we might we might move on. Um, I, I mean, there are a variety of other examples that uh, we could run through here, but um, I think that it's uh, it's available, or a lot of it is available up on the microsite. So I would encourage people to have a look at that and indeed ask questions. There are some questions from the audience, and we've got a little bit of time if people have additional questions. Uh, first of all, there's a um, uh, a, a strong approval of your of your um, magic wand, Owen. The idea that uh, we need harmonization, but magical harmonization, where people didn't have to go and do all the experimentation that they've done over the last couple of decades, um, is a, is a very good point. Thank you, Ashok. Um, this is, I think, a very interesting question, and perhaps you have some all have some ideas. So, how will you visualize? Um, some of the information that might be provided in some of this narrative. So uh, it's it's hard to express um, processes and methodologies and and desired outcomes um, that might might be described or indeed in diagrams or something of that nature in a company's uh, sustainability disclosure about um, materiality or their their risk assessments. Um, how how is that? information that's going to be sitting in narrative be utilized uh, by by all kinds of users. Any any thoughts? Yeah, I think it's it's fair to say that it's more complicated to envisage how narrative information will be compared across companies. I think that's fair to say. Which is part of the reason that that idea of of boiling down that narrative to an essence um, where it's indicating one of the particular categories was quite helpful because that gives you that first ability to compare about as far as you can go before you then have to go and look in more detail. I think what we've seen in a lot of now in sustainability reporting is some quite innovative approaches towards presenting information to people to making it visually appealing and understandable. I think as taxonomy developers we're going to have to be quite careful about figuring out what the crucial pieces of information to draw out of that are. And I know both the ISSB standards and the ESRS standards put a lot of emphasis on, you know, targets, metrics, those kind of things that are a bit more comparable between people, or at least their existence is more comparable. But even within that, you see that a particular companies may have targets. They may provide you information about their targets, but that particular target may be completely incomparable with anyone else's target. So it will be. I think it will be an interesting experience. And one of the things I'm sure we'll all be looking for as feedback on our taxonomies is kind of, will this give the right kind of information? And it's something we as standard setters are definitely going out and asking the users of this information. How do you need to compare this in a digital sense? Um, I don't know. Yep. It may be that you get no further than, you know, you can get to the report and then you go and read it. Uh, anyone want to add to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, first of all, I, I totally agree with Owen. Um, I think it's important really to ask those that are really using the data and analyzing it then how, how they would like to do it yeah, and, and what, how they work. Yeah? Because to be honest, I'm working mostly on the preparer side and our standard uh, setter side. 
But uh, on the consumer side, I think it's really, it's important not to, to involve them in the process and also in the consultations and everything, because it's really, it's, we, are, we are talking about their work actually, so they should be involved. Um, from my point of view, it's really important to, to try to um, enrich every narrative disclosure with some hard facts, yeah, if, if, if possible. Of course, there will be cases where it won't be possible, where we just have the pure text block tech with any content in. But even in, in then, in, in this case, I think, for instance, I remember a case at IFRAC where, he, where the disclosure requirement requested a diagram. Yeah, and uh, and where I clearly uh, try to explain to the standard setters, no, this is not how, how it's supposed to work. If you would like to have a diagram, it basically means you would like to have data, which are usually, for instance, numbers. And uh, please, if you require a diagram to be reported, at least require the same data being reported in a table as well that can be taken. So I think we also need to encourage standard setters um, to um, yeah, not to use things like uh, re requesting diagrams. Yeah, I mean, this is this is more like a, uh, uh, not a best practice. It's a, like a rather worse practice. Yeah? I'm not sure. It, it maybe we end up having still reports having diagrams. Yeah, but uh, we should really think about this if if we can avoid it in the future. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I. I, I have got one other question, and, and it's a little bit out there, but I wonder whether anybody has any perspectives, again, in relation to narrative. It just so happens that this week kind of coincides with the first public, um, really obviously useful utilization of machine interpretation of narrative. If you haven't played with GPT Chat 3 yet, I encourage everybody to go and do so. Um, it's pretty extraordinary what you're able to do. Um, I would hate to be a teacher or a lecturer because all of a sudden I have no idea whether an assignment is being produced by a human or by a machine because you can ask the machine to make it look like somebody else's work, which is concerning. But, it, but that is an aside. Do you think these kinds of technologies are likely to change the way you might have been thinking about narratives uh, as we go forward? It's a conversation we've definitely had and we've been investigating. Um, and one of the things it's probably telling us is that, yes, they changed the, the use of narrative and the interpretation of it slightly, but a lot of these technologies work much better if they can be focused in on relatively useful chunks of information to start with, to actually wade through an entire report and pick out a few useful things is a very tricky task with these kind of artificial tools. But to be given a couple of paragraphs of text that it knows the bits it's looking for are within there, suddenly it's a lot easier to train these things. Um, so I think there's still value in having the preparers tag and indicate where the information is supposed to be, but maybe it shifts the balance to quite what granularity you ask them to go to and quite how much detail. Maybe it's okay to have slightly larger narrative blocks without quite so much hard detail in there and then throw the AI at that part of it. Um, but I don't think it displaces the need for narrative tagging, but maybe it slightly tells you something about what the, the chunks of information people will try and consume are. And that's where we should try and balance our tags to. Any, any other thoughts on that? Uh, to be honest, I'm a little bit uh, more pessimistic on AI because <laughs> I am a software developer actually, and uh, we worked with AI once in, in, in also in, in terms of uh, XBRL. And it also, it, I mean, it, it, it was probably pretty, powerful and, and can achieve a lot of things. But what I've learned is if you are not having, for instance, the right data to learn the AI, or if you have not the, 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 the right um, a dictionary of words that needs to be used, uh, terms uh, that are related and everything, then the results can be, um, yeah, um, could be better. And um, so, Maybe there will be technology, but I think it should not be our focus to make something for, with a hope that somebody will fix it in the future. Let's fix it now, and 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 let's not, uh, um, uh, yeah, let's not build on AI R right now. Not not for the moment. Yeah, yeah. that's that would be my message. That sounds like a uh, an upbeat approach to uh, everybody's work going forward in this space. And uh, with that. 
can I thank Richard, Owen, and Stuart for your contributions to today's session and your work together uh, in helping bring about some consistency uh, and uh, clarity in the digitization of these sustainability measures. Um, thank you very much. So with that, I hope that people have enjoyed uh, the sessions that we've presented today at Data Amplified. We've tried to cover in some depth uh, these really seismic changes that are occurring in reporting around the world. Uh, financial reporting became an ordinary part of public companies in 1933. There's been a lot of minor changes to the way that works uh, since that time. Um, I mean, including minor things like digitization, but uh, we've never seen such an extraordinary set of changes as the ones that are coming now. And I think it's important that all of our stakeholders right around the world are conscious of what they are. So uh, we've heard about the, the uh, coming standards in the ISSB. We've heard about coming standards uh, and uh, rules that are, that are very much on the way within Europe under the CSRD and the European Sustainability Reporting Standards. We've heard a little bit about the environment in the United States and how, uh, whether it be through extraterritorial nature of some other people's disclosure arrangements or whether it's because of looming and, and coming uh, climate disclosures in the United States, this is something that's going to impact companies and supply chains there as well. Um, but uh, we will also, before long, uh, be uh, seeing this in many, many other parts of the world. Uh, and uh, that is the reason that we brought these, these, uh, these, these discussions together to, for, so for people to understand the status of what's occurring around the world in this area. We also talked about analytics and the importance in particular of traceability in these analytics, and hopefully you've enjoyed uh, the conversation at the end of today, uh, looking at the work of the SIG. So um, with that, I thank you very much, everybody, for all of your efforts and uh, all of your time. Uh, don't, don't forget that you can catch up on any of today's sessions uh, by logging back into the portal, and uh, we'll be in touch with other ways of accessing this information as we go forward. Uh, but for now, thank you very much from everyone at Data Amplified, and goodbye. Thanks again. Thank you.